talk about some end time stuff regarding Christians. And I want to talk about the latter days saints. You see, it's the latter days, and during this time, people are in a daze. We're in some very strange times right now. In Revelation 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, it talks about seven churches, and each church represents a different time in church history. And now we are in the last church period. This is Laodicea. You see, this church, it describes them as lukewarm. They've lost their zeal. They believe that they have need of nothing whatsoever. In Revelation 3, 14 through 22, if you want to read about that. But the church before that, the church in Philadelphia, is known for keeping his word. They're known for keeping the words of God. And that time period pictures the greatest time period in church history. The greatest thing you can do is be a Philadelphian Christian in Laodicea. Because you're living in the latter days. I mean, have you looked around? Have you heard about what's going on? Have you heard about how crazy people are? We're living in the last days of the church age. Men are dazed and confused. In 2 Timothy 3.1, it says, This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Is, so this, this is dangerous times. Perilous times is dangerous times. The wicked things that Paul is going to talk about in these verses have always been a problem with man, but we know we are in the last days and in perilous times because these things are done by people in the church. So let's look at these verses and you're going to see how you are in the last days of the church. In 2 Timothy 3, 2, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. So look at that, lovers of their own self. This makes them lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And this is the opposite of a God-fearing saint. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. They were ready to die any time for the faith. They loved the word and the Lord more than they ever loved anything about their life or this life. But what you have today is people who are lovers of their own self. It's all about preserving their self, all about preserving what makes them happy in the flesh. Now the next one is covetous. You got people that want what they want. They'll kill, they'll steal, and destroy to get it. And Christians do that to you verbally. They'll kill you and steal and destroy with their mouth to get what they want. And the world will do it to you physically and verbally. What drives a man to murder 10,000 babies as an abortionist in his career? The love of money. It's covetousness. What drives a Christian to kill a man's ministry with his mouth? He covets his ministry and wants his to be better than his. And then you got boasters. This is to be expected for people who are in love with their self, obviously someone who's bragging on their self, a boaster. A lot of pastors you're going to see in these latter days spend more time bragging on their self than they do on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the whole uh, message is about. Not very much Bible. They may use a Bible verse, and then they they simply say one verse and then, brag on themselves the rest of the time and t describe themselves to the congregation because they believe the congregation needs to be more like them. They actually have no idea about what the Bible really says. They're just egotists and they're boasters. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. The next one is proud. The Lord hates a proud look. Proverbs 6, 17. There's just no room anywhere in your life for being proud. There shouldn't be. 
you're saved because of Jesus Christ. You're living right because of Jesus Christ, if you are living right. And if you have anything at all, it is because he let you have it. So there's no need for you being proud. Anything you got that's good, it's because of him. Blasphemers. Not only are there haters of God in the world, but you have men in the church who have come to hate the King James Bible. They may be Christians, they may love the Lord, but all their time is spent correcting the Bible. And it, and it talks about in Romans 1.18, it talks about people who hold the truth and unrighteousness. You have men who have a King James Bible in their hand, and they correct what God says. Uh, they don't believe what God says, and they mock and attack you if you do believe what God says. Imagine a man holding the Bible and laughing at somebody for believing that the Bible's true and perfect. I mean, that's blasphemy in the church. The next thing is disobedient to parents. If a man won't respect his father who he can see, will he respect his father in heaven that he cannot see? Just like in 1 John 4.20, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Think about that towards your parents. If somebody is just disobedient to their parents, and always smarting off, telling them off, not doing what they say, if they don't respect their father who they can see, how are they going to respect the father who they cannot see? The next thing is unthankful. Usually, the more you have, the less thankful you become. And we're living in a time when the biggest complainers are bringing in two million a week. I mean, think about it. LeBron James bringing in two million a week. Some of these basketball players bringing in three three hundred thousand a game. But yet they complain more than anybody. You've got people that are so unthankful. Uh, Christians today, they got more than Christians ever have had. They're unthankful. They don't appreciate it. We're living in a time when Christians have 24-7 access to the Word of God, yet they never pick up the Word of God. You're living in the latter days. That's why there's a daze, D-A-Z-E. That's why they're so dazed and confused, because they forgot about the Bible a long time ago. They no longer use the Bible. Their pastor doesn't use the Bible. He doesn't make them fall in love with the Bible. He makes them fall in love with their self. The next thing is unholy. The average person on the street has the morals of Ahab and Jezebel, if not worse. I mean, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And those guys lived, Ahab and his wife lived a long time ago. So you can imagine how people are today. If things are getting worse with time, you get the picture about how bad people are today. And you need to know <clears throat> all this stuff because this is what you're presently living in as a Christian. And you may be living like a Philadelphian Christian in, a, in the Laodicea and last days of the church. But a lot of people aren't. It says in Leviticus 10 and verse 10 and that you put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. Today, people put no difference between these things. You go to a lot of churches and they don't, they don't, they don't have any standards. Anything goes. They don't put any difference between holy and unholy. They actually try to make things that are unholy to be holy. And the things that are holy, they make it look like it's evil and closed-minded. And in the average Christian circles today, they don't make any difference. It's just anything goes. Now, verse 3 in 2 Timothy 3, 3. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Now, without natural affection. This can go for a mom that won't take care of her baby or a man loving another man like he would a woman. And churches are accepting this as normal. And when I say churches, I don't mean the church. I mean churches around. I mean, 
in one way you're going to look at it, the church is perfect in Christ Jesus. But on the other hand, Christians, even though their their standing is perfect in the Lord, their state is a mess. And therefore, the churches, the local churches that they're in, are a mess. And they're accepting this stuff as normal. They're accepting it as normal to have a lesbian pastor, a homosexual pastor. They're accepting it as normal for a six-year-old boy to become a woman if he wants to. They're accepting it as normal for a woman to kill her child if she wants to. But the Bible plainly shows us that homosexuality is unnatural. It says in Romans 1, 26 through 27, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women to change their natural use into that which is against nature. It's not natural. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their last one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. So the world is so twisted, and a lover of self that they will be so cruel as to train up the children to be without natural affection. They train them up to accept this stuff easier and swallow it easier. And in Mark 9, 21, the un- unclean spirit, he came t- to the young man when he was of a child. They love to go out after the weakest link. And kids are easy targets for devils and for the degenerates of this world. They're easy targets. And the next thing is truce breakers. What you see in uh, churches is Christians can't quit fighting. And while they do this, they give occasion to blaspheme uh, to the lost world. And even backslid Christians, many times believers will separate with other believers entirely just because of this very reason. Truce breakers. Uh, Christians that cannot keep their word. And they get in fights over it. And it just gives occasion to blaspheme. False accusers. They say Christians think that they're better than other people. That's what you always have them saying. Is false accusing you. Or all white people are racist. That's a false accusation. Or the Bible is hate speech. Uh, The Christians even go around many times falsely accusing each other in the churches. So it's, these are things that are describing the last days of the church. And like I said, the church, which is his body, obviously, we're perfect in Christ. But on a day-to-day sense, and as individuals, we, we have to watch ourselves not to have all these things in our life. And it says, in incontinent, their sexual urges can't be restrained. Christian women dress like hoes, and the men watch pornography. Mix both of those together, and what do you have? You've got a mess. Fierce, like the devil-possessed maniac in Matthew 8, 28. That maniac cried, cut himself with stones, broke his chains, and was an emotional wreck. He was angry and furious. And Christians can get so far away from God that they're just flat out mean and hateful. They're standing in Christ. It's perfect. But their state, however, it's a mess because they're refusing to live by Bible principles. They're refusing to Look at the pattern that Paul left, that the Lord Jesus Christ left. And they get off into all these latter days sins. The next thing is despisers of those that are good. That's why they accuse you falsely. Those false accusers accuse you falsely. Because they're despisers of those that are good. There are Christians who will accuse you just like a lost person would. They say you think you're better than everyone else. 
Uh, I've been told that I'm a fanatic or overboard or silly and taking it too far. And they despise those who, they despise people who they think is living better than they are. They despise those who are doing things that they think they should do, that they're too lazy to do or too ashamed to do. On the other hand, you have people tell you, well, you're so good, I wish I could be like you. And that's even worse. They are both falsely accusing me. No man is good but God himself. My soul is good. Your soul is good if you're saved because it's got God on it. But our flesh is horrible. And we have to reckon the flesh to be dead daily. Every morning when you wake up, you have to say, I'm my soul's perfect in Christ, but my flesh is wretched, and I'm going to have to walk in the Spirit, walk in the Holy Spirit of God, or I'm going to be a mess. It says in 1 Peter 3.16, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You see, you have to bend and twist things to make a God-fearing man become a lawbreaker. Because he's not going to break the law. He's trying to live right. You must falsely accuse a God-fearing man to get him in trouble. You have to lie about him. And if you call evil good and good evil then you can turn men against the good man. If you can brainwash people into thinking, as Isaiah 5.20 says, evil is good and good is evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, you can make people think that the good man is the evil man. You can make laws to where the good man becomes the lawbreaker because you've got things so twisted. And that's the way things are headed in these latter days. When you stand in contrast to the wicked things of the world, then you will be despised. It says in 1 John 3.13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. John 15.18, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. So don't think it's strange when you're living for the Lord, you're a King James Bible believer, you believe the Bible's right over what anybody says. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Now the next thing is traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, a traitor, one who betrays. You consistently see men stabbing you in the back, even in the Christian circles. They sit around and bite and devour one another. Uh, they're heady, those who make decisions based on their emotions. This is because they lost the word of God a long time ago. So now it's all about emotions. They don't live by Bible principles. They live by a feeling and emotion. So when they are without natural affection, at the same time, they justify themselves. They say it just feels right. They don't care about what the Bible actually says. They put emotion and their feeling over what the Bible says. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They look great on the outside. Uh, Jesus said the Pharisees were like whited sepulchers. They look good outwardly, but they are dead men's bones when it comes to their heart. You may look the part. You may be able to act out the part in front of certain people, but is your heart right with God? Uh, Paul says, from such, turn away. Sometimes there is a need to separate from other Christians because apostasy is contagious. Many of them, they have a form of godliness. It's like this. They can be saved and even look like they're acting like a Christian on the outside. Their soul is in good shape because it's saved. Their flesh appears to be in good shape, but really, their heart is far from the Lord. They just have a form of godliness. And that's what's going on in these latter days with Christians in their walk, in their state, is 
their heart is far from God. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you have latter days creeps. They creep into houses and beguile the women by their subtlety. As it says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. They are ever learning. And in the last days, education takes a front seat. They're ever learning. And they put the Bible in the trunk. They get so educated that they no longer believe the words of God. They talk about higher learning. Well, we wrestled against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 And remember that knowledge puffeth up. 1 Corinthians 8.1 But you have these people, they are ever learning. And in Romans 1.22 it talks about how they professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Sometimes the smarter you get, the dumber you get. They continue to learn, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. They get so educated that they no longer even consider the idea that Jesus Christ died for their sins. They no longer even want to retain God in their knowledge. And then the saved person even can get so educated that he no longer takes the Bible as literal anymore. To him, it's just all allegorical. It's just good li little life lessons here and there. It says in 2 Timothy 3.8, Now as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. In the last days, you will find resistance to the truth. Uh, you can't say what you want to say anymore. They want to censor it. They want to put a disclaimer on it. They want to fact check it and say it's not a fact, even if it really is. Just like Janice and Jambres, most likely the two magicians that went against Moses and withstood him, you're going to have men withstanding you. And now in 1 Timothy 4.1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the Spirit speaks expressly. He speaks plainly where anybody can understand. And the guys who are ever learning and just running in place want you to believe that you can't understand it. you got to go to them to understand it. But in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Instead of following the Holy Spirit, they hook up with seducing spirits. Instead of holding on to sound doctrine, they teach doctrines of devils. And this is a last day's warning you have here against the cults. You know, when I drive down the road, I don't see Bible-believing church here, Bible-believing church here, just everywhere I go. Like, a lot of people think that's the way it is, the way I live. When I drive down the road, I see Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Church of Christ. Just from my house, before I get very far away, I, I see like two or three Church of Christ churches right on the same road there with zero Bible-believing Baptist churches on that road. You know, a lot of people say you need to stay off of the the YouTube, quit watching um, Bible videos on YouTube because it's it's just all false doctrine. Okay, well, drive down the road. There's a lot of false doctrine there too. Most of the Baptist churches themselves have even got rid of the Bible. They got rid of their standards. Anything goes. It doesn't matter which Bible you use to them. It doesn't matter what you do. Because it's perilous times out there concerning basic Bible doctrine. And they are speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. You see, the Catholic Church forbids their priests and nuns to marry, that, and that's a doctrine of a devil. Some Baptist pastors for, forbid a divorced man to remarry. They say he can't remarry until his wife dies. So he has to live like that. You know, if he's 20 and his wife went crazy and cheated on him, ran off with another man while she's 20, you know, they say he's not allowed to remarry until she dies, which she could die before him and she could live to be 90. So he has to live burning in his lust for 
70 years. I mean, that's crazy. Forbidding to marry. The Bible calls that a doctrine of a devil. Any cult that forces you to abstain from meats is a doctrine of a devil. It says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. You can eat any meat as long as you give thanks for it. And you'll notice that <coughs> in this church period, the focus is on the physical things constantly. What they can see with their eyes. But they're blind spiritually. So what should you do as a saint in the latter days? Do you want to be a Philadelphian Christian in the Laodicea? Or do you want to be a latter days saint? A saint that's just in the days like everybody else is. In 1 Timothy 4, 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So put people in remembrance of what's going on. If you want to be a good saint during this time, to the best of your ability, put them in remembrance of sound doctrine. If you're going to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, then get into the words of the book and good doctrine because, you know, the Philadelphian Christian kept the words. Laodicea, they're going by their emotion. They're going by their feeling. They're going about the physical things, not spiritual things. They've left the word in the back seat, in the trunk. They don't, they're not going to return to it again. You got to get into the words and the good doctrine. Doctrine is lost in the last days. Men do not know the basic doctrines of the Bible. They don't know anything about the Bible. When they approach the Bible at all, it's always a devotional aspect only of the Bible. You could go up to the average Baptist, ask them why do they have eternal security, ask them why do they use a King James Bible, ask them anything, and they're just going to look at you like you're crazy. They don't know anything about the Bible. That's because it's it's been thrown in the trunk. And it says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, But refuse profane and old wild fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You see, the last day's focus is on the physical. What meat are you eating? How much are you exercising? What type of clothes are you wearing? And a lot of this stuff is good in its rightful place. But however, in the last days, this stuff is put on the forefront and Bible doctrine is put on the shelf. It says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So you see a big thing for people today is going to the gym, get the perfect body, look like some type of celebrity so you can post it on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. But it, exercise is good, but it profiteth little. A spiritual exercise and exercising godliness profits in this life and in the world to come. Notice godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is, it'll help you in this life on this earth and of that which is to come. It's going to help you in eternity. Bodily exercise doesn't. Keep your senses exercised in the scriptures. Studying is hard on the flesh. It's an exercise itself. Living godly is hard on the f flesh, but it profits in eternity. 1 Timothy 4 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labor and and suffer reproach because we trust in a living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Living godly in the last days is going to involve labor and it's going to involve suffering. So just remember that as a Christian, <coughs> a Christian living in the latter days. It says in 1 Timothy 4.11, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Don't be a latter-day slacker. Be an example. A temptation of the youth, youthful Christian is to ditch the old book, ditch the old past, get involved in the new, exciting, and worldly world of Christianity today. 
But in that world, you lose the Bible. The focus is no longer the Bible. You just lose the Bible completely. They are no longer nourished up in the faith and doctrine. He says in 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. No matter how old you get or how long you do it, you never stop reading the Bible and learning something new out of the Bible consistently every day. In 1 Timothy 4.14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy, by laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Meditate and give yourself wholly to the book. Eat, sleep, and breathe the book. Take it to work. Take it to bed. Take it to church. Take it on trips. Take it on a drive. Take it to the doctor's office. Give yourself wholly to it. And this is your last day's defense. 1 Timothy 4.16 Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. This doesn't mean saved as in saved from hell. This means saved when it comes to not being deceived and tricked by all the false doctrine going on. If you stay in the book and living godly, then you're going to be safe from the bad doctrine going all over Christianity today. But I'm going to end this with what Jesus Christ said to the last days church time period, the layout of sins. He said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, will sup with him, and he with me. So if you're a Christian, you feel like you're away from God, you feel like you are a latter-day saint, a saint that's just walking around dazed and confused, open the door. Talk to God. Confess your sin to God. Tell Him that you want to live for Him. You're already saved. This isn't for salvation. If you're a Christian, you're already saved. You don't have to worry about losing it. But you're out of fellowship. So confess your sins to the Lord. Tell Him you want to live for Him. And then open the door. Open the book. Begin reading it, studying it. It's your last day's defense from bad doctrine. And all the things that's going on. But if you're a Christian, don't become a latter days saint.